Well done, said Aslan, in a voice that made the earth shake. Then Diggory knew that all the Narnians had heard those words, and that the story of them would be handed down from father to son in that new world for hundreds of years, perhaps forever. But he was no longer, but he was in no danger of feeling conceited, for he didn't think about it all at all now that he was face to face with Aslan. This time he found he could look straight into the lion's eyes. He'd forgotten his troubles and felt absolutely content. Well done, son of Adam, said the lion again. For this fruit you have hungered and thirsted and wept. No hand but yours shall sow the seed of the tree that is to be the protection of Narnia. Throw the apple towards the river bank, where the ground is soft. Diggory did as he was told. Everyone had grown so quiet that you could hear the soft thump where it fell into the mud. It is well thrown, said Aslan. Now, let us proceed to the coronation of King Frank of Narnia and Helen his queen. The children now noticed these two for the first time. They were dressed in strange and beautiful clothes and from their shoulders rich robes flowed out behind them to where four dwarfs held up the king's train and four river nymphs the queen's. Their heads were bare but Helen had let her hair down and it made a great improvement in her appearance. But it was neither hair nor clothes that made them look so different from their old selves. Their faces had a new expression, especially the king's. All the sharpness and cunning and quarrelsome, which he'd picked up as a London cabbie, seemed to have washed away. And the courage and kindness, which he'd always had, were now easier to see. Perhaps it was the young world of the air that had done it, or talking with Aslan, or both. Upon my word, whispered Fledge to Polly, my old master's been changed nearly as much as I have. Why, he's a real master now. Yeah, but don't buzz in my ear like that, said Polly. It tickles so. Now, said Aslan, some of you undo that tangle you've made with those trees, and let's see what we shall find there. Diggory now saw that uh, where four trees grew close together, their branches had all been laced together or tied together with switches so as to make a sort of a cage. The two elephants with their trunks and a few dwarfs with their little axes soon got it all undone. There were three things inside. One was a young tree that seemed to be made of gold. The second was a young tree that seemed to be made of silver. But the third was a miserable object in muddy clothes sitting hunched up between them. Gosh, whispered Diggory, Uncle Andrew. <coughs> to explain all of this, we must go back a bit. The beasts, you remember, had tried planting and watering him. When the watering had brought him to his senses, he found himself soaking wet, buried up to his thighs in earth, which was quickly turning into mud, and surrounded by more wild animals than he'd dreamed of in his life before. It was perhaps not surprising that he began to scream and howl. This was in a way a good thing, for at last it persuaded everyone, even the warthog, that he was alive. So they dug him up again. His trousers were a really shocking state by now. As soon as his legs were free, he tried to bolt, but one swift curl of the elephant's trunk around his waist soon put an end to that. Everyone now thought he must be safely kept somewhere till Aslan had time to come and see him and say what should be done about him. So they made a sort of a cage or a coop all round him. They offered him everything they could think of to eat. The donkey collected great piles of thistles and threw them in, but Uncle Andrew didn't seem to care about them. The squirrels bombarded him with volleys of nuts, but he only covered his head with his hands and tried to keep out of the way. Several birds flew to and fro, diligently dropping worms on him. 
The bear was especially kind. During the afternoon he'd found a wild bee's nest, and instead of eating it himself, which he would very much like to have done, this worthy creature brought it back to Uncle Andrew. But this was, in fact, the worst failure of all. The bear lobbed the whole sticky mass over the top of the enclosure, and unfortunately he, it hit Uncle Andrew's slap in the face, and not all the bees were dead. The bear, who would not at all have minded being hit in the face by a honeycomb himself, could not understand why Uncle Andrew staggered back, slipped and sat down. And it was sheer bad luck that he sat down on the pile of thistles. And anyway, said the warthog, quite a lot of honey has got into the creature's mouth, and that's bound to have done it some good. They were really getting quite fond of their strange pet, and hoped that Aslan would allow them to keep it. The cleverer ones were quite sure by now that at least some of the noises which came out of his mouth had a meaning. They christened him Brandy, because that's the noise he made so often. In the end, however, they had to leave him there for the night. Aslan was busy all that day instructing the new king and queen and doing other important things, and could not attempt to attend to poor old Brandy. What with the nuts, pears, apples and bananas that had been thrown into him, he did fairly well for supper, but it would not be true to say that he passed an agreeable night. Bring out that creature, said Aslan. One of the elephants lifted Uncle Andrew in his trunk and laid him at the lion's feet. He was too frightened to move. Poor Aslan, said Polly. Could you say something to, to unfrighten him? And then could you say something to prevent him ever coming back here again? Do you think he wants to? Said Aslan. Well, Aslan, said Polly, he might send someone else. He's so excited about the bar off the lamppost growing into a lamppost tree. And he thinks... He thinks great folly, child, said Aslan. This world is bursting with life for those few days because the song which I called it into life still hangs in the air and rumbles in the ground. It will not be so for long. But I cannot tell this to this old sinner and I cannot comfort him either. He has made himself unable to hear my voice. If I spoke to him, he would only hear growlings and roarings. Oh, Adam's sons, how cleverly you defend yourself against all that might do you good. But I will give him the only gift he's still able to receive. He bowed his great head rather sadly and breathed into the magician's terrified face. Sleep, he said. Sleep and be separated for some few hours from all the torments you have devised for yourself. Uncle Andrew immediately ro rolled over with closed eyes and began breathing peacefully.